So, hello everyone. As Dov said, I'm Reza Ahmad, uh, working for University of Manchester in Axel Nobel Lab for Corrosion and Protection. And uh, uh, as part of the SARS Code Partnership, SARS Code Prosperity Partnership. So, my the title of my talk is A Microstructural Evolution of Polyester Powder Coating Exposed to Neutral Salt Spray. And uh, so, during this talk, uh, I will start with a brief introduction to the problem that exists, and then we'll uh, talk, about, uh, talk about the aim and objectives, and go through the materials and methods, uh, exposure methods that are used for exposure of these panels, and go through the results and finish with uh, some conclusions. So, Organic coatings are cheap and relatively easy methods to be applied and provide protections for the uh, substrate and the structures, uh, but uh, they fail after uh, some time ex uh, exposing and working, and the failure is usually spontaneous, so, and without seeing any signs of physical damage, and we don't know exactly what is happening there. So one, uh, hypothesis, uh, one model actually to justify that is the ingrain model, which based on the fact that we see the resistance of organic coatings reduces over time. And uh, uh, after a while, uh, re re results in the failure of the coating. So this uh, uh, led to the formation of this hypothesis that uh, organic coatings are heterogeneous in nature. And uh, this will allow different uptake of the environment. Uh, so, and after exposure, and uh, due to the exposure and environmental stresses, these heterogeneous regions grow in size until they reach to the substrate and uh, uh, actually results in corrosion, as it is shown in this talk figure. But organic coatings are not a simple polymeric binder and curing agents, uh, as it is mentioned by by uh, Simon, actually, there are a lot of different active inhibitors, pigments, different uh, additives there added to the organic coatings. So it is important to understand that how these different pigments uh, actually affect the formation of these percolating networks and affect these heterogeneities within the coating and how they eventually result on the failure. So based on this short introduction, the aim of my work is to understand the structure of powder coating system as a function of service lifetime and correlate that to the coating performance. And uh, so for to achieve our aims, we define these three objectives, which are to explore the link between the onset of corrosion and the initiation uh, and the initiation and development of damage pass phase in the coating to develop a detailed quantitative uh, description for the coating, including chemistry and the structure across the length scale, and to build the 3D structure of the coating systems. And hopefully by this, uh, we will be able to identify the key microstructural features that results in enhanced or performa poor performance of the coating and also identify the uh, coating failure mechanism associated with the failure and its evolution. And when we understand what is the failure mechanism, hopefully we will be able to actually block these uh, uh, weak points that results in the failure. Uh, so going through the materials, so what I have investigated and characterized are uh, powder, uh, one layer polyester powder coatings and uh, uh, which are prepared by Axon Nobel and uh, been exposed in Axon Nobel and then so sent for me. The inhibitor in these coatings is aluminum triphosphate and uh, uh, but also we have fillers such as aluminum hydroxide and few other uh, fillers there as well. And after preparing these uh, panels, the panels usually are scratched. The scratch is here, uh, but uh, in these panels, the scratch area is removed uh, for measuring the, inter the corrosion underneath the coating. And, and then they are exposed uh, to neutral salt spray test, which is a continuously for 1,440 hours. And we have another exposure method that is, which is a cyclic corrosion test, which is a combination of UV exposure, condensation, neutral salt spray, and also freezing at minus 20 degrees centigrade. Uh, 
So as you can see on these panels that are sent for me, a neutral salt spray test uh, only resulted in the failure of this panel, while the other panels did not show any failure. However, the panels that were exposed to the cyclic corrosion test all showed failure at, uh, after four months, and then after six months, actually, some of the panels were completely ruined, and basically, I didn't have any coating there to investigate. Uh, so let's start with the pigments uh, that were incorporated into the coating. So uh, on the left, you can see the SEM images from the coating showing the pigment distributions, the top surface and the cross section. Uh, as uh, it is evident, so we had aluminum hydroxide particles in the coating. So and the EDS elemental maps show presence of aluminum and actually oxygen. So these are the aluminum hydroxide particles within the coating. And we had aluminum triphosphate. So phosphorus, uh, phosphorus, uh, phosphorus element actually shows where the inhibitor pigments are located within these coatings. But other than these, we also had uh, calcium and silicon uh, uh, detected within this coating. So we didn't know where, where is the actual source of these pigments. So we looked at the raw powders, and when we did that, we actually realized that the inhibitor, which was aluminum triphosphate, is not a pure compound. And actually, there are calcium uh, and silicon, which actually seems to be together. And uh, probably calcium silicate exists within this aluminum uh, triphosphate inhibitor pigment. On the other hand, the aluminum uh, hydroxide particles appears to be like uh, pure with some contaminations of copper. I'm not sure whether it's some kind of treatment on these aluminum, uh, aluminum hydroxide particles or it is a contamination within them. So uh, starting the characterizations of the samples with the unexposed panel. And I've used initially low accelerating voltage to look at the top surface of the coating. And uh, as you can see, the top surface looks to be uh, smooth without no apparent uh, defect or uh, significant change of in the topography. And also when we increase the accelerating voltage of SEM, uh, we can see the particle distributions within the coating, which appears to be a random distribution. And I haven't been able to detect at least from the top surface any agglomeration or something. But if we uh, zoom in and look at the fine, uh, finer details, we can see that actually in the back scattered electron image, there is a change of contrast, which could indicate that there is a change in the uh, material and uh, uh, atomic number. And actually, we associated this with the pigments that are underneath the coating and are breaking through the surface. So as you can see here, there is a, there is a heterogeneity here. And if we increase the accelerating voltage, we can see exactly underneath this, there is a pigment there. And most of these pigments that are, uh, and this is actually similar things, but from the cross sections. But you can see also there is a, like a crack at the edge of these uh, surface uh, breaking particles that may allow transport, uh, may allow actually environment to move in at least up to this point, if we assume there is not further damage done. And uh, also, we ha I have seen clusters of aluminum hydroxide formation within these coatings, and uh, this could also affect the performance, uh, which we will talk later. So the other thing that may lead to the exposure of the pigments to the environment is actually mechanical damage on the surface. I've observed that actually similar change in the contrast is observed when you also have a mechanical damage, which indicate that actually a pigment is exposed to the environment. So, and looking at the, again, unexposed panels, we can see that uh, some of the particles are fractured within these coatings. And also we can see like cracks within the particles, but still this crack hasn't led to the fracture of the pigments. And the source of these cracks actually, I think it can be within the pigments itself. This is, these are the images from the raw, for the raw pigments. And we can see some cracks within the pigments itself, but also during the formulation and uh, mixing these uh, powder coatings, there is a, like a, a different pro steps and processes the powders are going through which each one of them seems to uh, can put some stress and force on the pigments and results in further fracturing of the pigments or make the cracks within them. Now I'm uh, started characterizing the uh, exposed panels, the panels which were exposed to the cyclic corrosion test actually. 
So what you can see here is that uh, this low magnification image shows that uh, actually there is no blister, no evident blister actually there, but we can see crack formations on the surface. And also there is a crack here. So this was on the samples which were exposed after six months and also on the sample which was exposed after four months. So the cracks starts on the samples and then propagate, these are the propagation tips of the cracks into the coating and then propagates through the coating. So uh, we need to think about how the cracks develop within the coating. So there are different stages involved. So we have an initiation stage for the crack usually and then we have a propagation stage. So the initiation stage is usually a, a statistical process uh, that happens at preferential places. And so what are these preferential places for the crack to initiate? It could be when we have a, like a large particle and a, a polymeric binder, then when there are a stress exposed, a stress applied to the coating, the particle is harder, but the polymeric binder is soft. So the particle cannot change shape similar to the polymeric binder, and that way generate some stress concentrations at that interface. So one of these stress initiation and preferential places for uh, crack initiations could be the interface of the uh, particles, especially large particles that we have in the coating. So as you can see here, uh, we have evidences that actually a gap has started forming after cyclic corrosion test, and here. So this is the first initiation sites that uh, we have uh, identified and uh, actually and then after the initiation now how the crack propagates will depend on different parameters and different factors so our different rules will be uh, followed and it will be depending on the uh, actually stress intensity factor of the crack and as you can see here it seems like these cracks have already started to propagate and uh, the tip looks like a, a uh, very similar to the tips of the cracks that are propagating through the coating. But this is probably at the early initiations of the crack that is going to propagate through the coating. So the other place that we observed is that actually these seed uh, particles are breaking and uh, are breaks within the coatings. So uh, also during the cyclic corrosion test, we had uh, cracks within the particles. So those also may lead to the uh, fracturing of these particles. But as it is evident here, we have a fractured particle, but then it looks like that the crack has started to propagate from this crack, uh, uh, from this fractured particle into the coating. So this is the second initiation site that may uh, exist there. Uh, there is a third uh, initiation site that we identified and that correlates with the uh, actually substrate. So when we have a rough substrate, that rough substrate may create the conditions uh, uh, for a fatigue crack to form within the coating and due to the cyclic exposure test. So these samples actually are, look, I am looking at the coatings which were not actually removed from the scratch. Near, actually, these coatings are from the near scratch uh, regions. So as you can see, wherever I have a, like a rough surface, I could see crack has formed and corrosion product has penetrated into these regions. So uh, I think probably due to the geometry of the substrate, this generated a stress field and the stress concentrations within the polymeric uh, binder that has resulted eventually in the crack formations due to the exposure. And then corrosion process has started from the defect and penetrating underneath the coating and reaches here and fills the crack. These bottom uh, figures are for a coating that actually, which is far away from the uh, scratch. So as you can see in this low magnification image, we do not have any blister, uh, evident blister, but if we zoom in, we can see corrosion product already has formed and also a crack has developed here and filled with corrosion product. So I think here we can have actually two hypotheses that can justify this. So one hypothesis is that actually the crack generates and then due to the cyclic exposure, it propagates until it reaches to the top surface and allows the environment to go in and uh, results uh, in the corrosion process to happen. 
And when corrosion starts, also cracks get filled with the corrosion products. But there is another scenario that actually, this, this is a stress concentration point within the coating. So after a few cycles, it is possible that the, uh, this area, the coating becomes delaminated from the substrate. And uh, then we know uh, water and oxygen can penetrate into the coating. And at this point, actually uh, corrosion may start at this area and then corrosion leads to further damage and cracking of the coating. So uh, I think the, for the site samples that were exposed to the cyclic corrosion test, the failure has happened due to the crack initiation and propagation and uh, allows the environment to reach to the metallic substrate. But then when the uh, corrosion starts, it will lead to the blister formation. As you can see here, it's, a, it's actually, I think, two blisters that are connected together and are filled with corrosion product. But at this stage, we can see also crack starts to form within the coating at the periphery of the blisters. And these cracks are filled with corrosion product. But also we have other cases that corrosion product is detected at the ease interface, but there are no evident cracks there. So the question to be answered is that how these corrosion products has uh, deposited there. Is there a, uh, interconnected networks there that allows transport of uh, corrosion products there, or actually there are uh, the, there is pathways exist within the polymer itself that allows organic coating uh, that allows corrosion products to move there and get deposited. And actually, what has happened at to this uh, to this interface? There is. Another uh, actually interesting image is that when we looked at the particles near at the corrosion sites, it's like a cluster of particles. We could see almost corrosion products is at the interface of all of them. So it is possible that actually these particles are uh, providing the transport path and these interconnected uh, particles and the interface of them is a weak point. So when I say a weak point, actually, um, we are still need to do more work because we are not clarified whether there is a detachment there has happened uh, or uh, actually there is a, some uh, change in the chemistry of there that allows it to be more hydrophilic and allows more transport of different ions through it. So I tried to look at into more details into these region, closed regions. So as you can see here, corrosion product, as it is evident here, is already deposited at this interface. And if I increase the magnification, I can see a gap exists, which is in the range of the 100 nanometer. And uh, actually it is filled with corrosion product. But there is also another cases, and again, at this region, I can see from the EDS elemental maps that uh, corrosion uh, product and ion is deposited at this interface, but by looking at this, I couldn't see any gap. So it may also indicate that actually there are some passes within the polymer or a combination of the two hypotheses that exist. But which one is true? I think we need to do more work. We are not clear on that. So now I move uh, and characterize the coatings that were exposed to the neutral sulfur spray test. Uh, specifically, these are all the samples which were actually showed failure because the other samples didn't show any failure. So what, what happens is after the corrosion initiates and the blister forms, the, what, what we saw is completely similar to the, what we observed for the samples which were exposed to the cyclic corrosion test and corrosion product depositing at the interface of the particles, crack within the coatings, also uh, the interface of uh, aluminum hydroxide particles getting filled with corrosion products, and uh, so on. So, but when we looked at the um, uh, unexposed, uh, apparently intact areas, actually, we couldn't see any crack formations on the samples that were exposed to the neutral salt spray test. So in order to find out the reason and uh, why this panel has failed, we have started comparing this panel with the panels that uh, didn't show any signs of failure. First, the first thing that we observed is that actually the thickness of the panel that is failed is significantly lower compared to the, th to the other panels. And uh, also we observed that there is a detachment at the interface of this coating with the substrate which does not exist on the unexposed samples and the other samples which were exposed to the neutral salt spray test, which could indicate that there are lower adhesion of the coating to the substrate. 
but why what uh, what has caused this lower adhesion in order to do that i started doing using uh, doing some eds analysis and it is mapping of the interface regions of the part uh, of this coating and i could detect actually there are some kind of uh, contamination on the surface as you can see i have detected uh, sodium at the interface but also i have detected uh, uh, iron within the coating and uh, these kind of uh, actually uh, so I'm here I can co I compared it with the samples which didn't show any signs of failure and as you can see there are no con uh, no contaminations at that interface so I think this contamination has resulted in lower adhesion of this coating to the substrate but I believe it's not the main reason for the failure and I will actually try to convince you later in the next few slides. So the next thing that I started to do is to use actually in some, do some image analysis. I used ImageJ to segment the pigments of these coatings and then I try to measure or calculate the uh, some estimations for the pigment volume concentration within these coatings. So the pigment, the coating that showed failure uh, appears to have higher concentrations of pigments within it and uh, while the other panels showed lower concentrations of the pigment. And the difference is not significant, it's only 3%, but if you think that the percolation threshold for a uniform uh, spherical particles is around 16%, and since these particles are non-uniform with different uh, ranges, and it may lead to a higher percolation threshold, so we may expect that the percolation threshold is within actually this range. So 3% will, will mean that we're being above the percolation threshold or below the percolation threshold. And actually we have a clusters of connected particles formed within the coating or there is no clusters within the coating and can affect actually the performance. So the other thing that with this analysis showed me is that we can use those data to look at the size distributions of the pigment. So of course, we had higher pigment volume concentration within the failed panel, so which probably results in higher, higher pigments with higher, um, uh, higher number of pigments within these coatings. And I'm looking at the larger pigments here at this graph. And so in order to compare them, I needed to normalize them. What I have done is actually to normalize these uh, numbers with the PVCs. And uh, again, even after we normalize them and we divide these numbers by the PVC that, that we calculated here, we still will get higher pigment numbers for the samples that is failed. And also, if you look at the microstructure of this failed panel, we can see pigments exist within this panel that actually span more than half of the coating thickness. So having said that now, I realized that actually in the panel that is failed, we have an area which is uh, showing a lot of blisters, but then we have another area which is not showing actually corrosion formation. So I decided to look at these different regions and I prepared a sample from this. So we have an area which is actually under the tape, so it hasn't been exposed to the environment. And then we have an area which doesn't show any failure or corrosion. And then we have an area which is full of blisters and corrosion products. So the first thing that uh, I observed is the, my looking at the interface and actually I could see that the coating is detached from the substrate on apparently intact regions and also on the corroded regions. So, and when I did the EDS, actually I could detect the contamination at all the, uh, these interfaces, which may indicate that this contamination exists everywhere on this surface and has resulted in uh, lower adhesion uh, 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 adhesion, but it probably is not the main cause for the failure of these panels. And also I did similar jobs using ImageJ to segment the pigments, again for the area which were under the tape and the area uh, which uh, showed uh, uh, failure, and uh, which showed uh, failure, again there was a difference in pigment volume concentration. So local pigment volume concentration over the length is different, and due to a reason actually there are higher pigment concentrations here, which I'm not clear at exactly. So these 
coatings are formulated, uh, applied by electrostatic guns. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly why this kind of change in pigment variation and the local position may happen. But I need to talk with the AXO people actually to get a better understanding of what has happened there. So our hypothesis here was actually, so uh, the evidence suggested that probably there is an elongated clusters forming there. We have a lower thickness. Uh, so we decided to do a X-ray CT of this, uh, a blister, actually, so you can see a blister. So in order to do that, we needed to lower the thickness of the substrate, and then we used a triple beam, uh, a triple beam SEM, which has actually uh, both a laser uh, installed on the SEM and also a plasma fib to prepare this sample, and then we use this sample to uh, get our X-ray CT data. So these are just two slices of the X-ray CT data from the entire blister, so uh, I think the slices are somewhere in the middle of this blister. And as you can see, uh, we have crack formation which are filled with corrosion products, but the other thing is that uh, the data were relatively noisy, especially uh, at the coating uh, near the interface, then that's because of the very rough surface of the substrate, which resulted in this noisy data. So actually I could not do, uh, I could not uh, do segmentation and measure the pigment volume concentration and correlate that with my 2D analysis of and segmentation data. But these data were revealing. Uh, first of all, uh, we observed that a crack has forming there. So corrosion, uh, it's, uh, corrosion starts to form due to a reason, and uh, then when the corrosion product volume increases, at some points crack forms here, and it leads actually, as I said, to the, we develop a hypothesis that these cracks will go around the particle, uh, around the blister completely, and eventually will lead to the detachment of this blister from the substrate, and actually will uh, exacerbate the situation. And also the way that the cracks has formed may suggest that this is a brittle uh, fracture that is happening and actually these powder coatings are behaving as a uh, brittle material may behave. Uh, so, but I, uh, I was interested to look at the central regions of the blisters, which first of all were less noisy, but if we assume that uh, uh, corrosion starts at, the same, at an area within the coating and then uniformly leads to the formations and growth of a blister. So I expect that if I can find any failure, it will be within these regions. So this is the area that I've marked here is the area that has, uh, actually I'm going to look and focus. Uh, so these are just few slices again here. As you can see, I have uh, crack formations along the interface of the particles. Also, uh, fractured pigments exist within this part within this coating as well, and the same uh, cracks along the interface of particles exist also here. Uh, so, uh, but these are within the coating, and in the case of the samples that were exposed to the uh, cyclic corrosion test. We could consider them the formation forming during the exposure, but here the sample was exposed only to neutral salt spray test. But since they are also in the center, when the blister formation is happening, it is possible that the stress generated within the coat due to the blister formation results in the uh, formation of these cracks. So we could not actually, we cannot actually rule it out that these are not the cause of the failure, but what I'm interested actually is more is formations of these elongated clusters of particles within the coating uh, that we, I actually believe that the interface of these are weak and will allow the uh, transport of environment along this interface. So, um, and since I do not have control over the movie first, I will explain this is a movie that I'm going to ask to play later, but uh, there are like, uh, <coughs> cracks formation that you can see, but what I'm interested in more is the uh, elongated clusters that I've shown here and I show you to visualize them here. So can you please? Uh, yeah. Yes, please. Reza, can you start to conclude, please? Yes. So, just a simple uh, video that's going through the slide. And Reza, can you just go back to the microphone? Oh, sorry. And at this point, you can see that actually a blister is there, but immediately it finishes and another one forms. And then there is 
another elongated cluster here, which apparently I missed it, but it was there. And actually it is here in this slice. And then if we segment it and show it, we can see that these, but they are actually not only two pigments there, but it is a cluster of pigments that elongates through the thickness of the coating. And this is the positions of the pigments within the blister. So almost in the central region. And uh, I think this can be the reason for the failure. The other thing that this is the last slide, I believe uh, that has resulted in the, uh, the other thing that I wanted to show is that when the blisters forms, we see that cracks starts to form around it. But then it was also, uh, we observed in the previous uh, results as well. But the other thing is that when the blister grows, more cracks starts to form, but it's not only around it. So which leads, may lead to the detachment of this coating on the blister eventually. But the crack seems to deviate out and actually uh, move out and uh, further uh, damage the coating and continue this way. And that's the reason that maybe we get a complete removal of the coatings on the samples which were exposed for six months into the environment. And uh, finally, to conclude, uh, actually, so uh, crack initiation and propagation appears to be the main cause of failure for the samples to expose to cyclic corrosion test. Three main initiation sites are proposed, uh, which are at the interface of the pigments with the particle, and uh, also fractured particles within the coating and uh, uh, rough surface variations on the substrate. Also, a failure of panels exposed to the neutral salt spray test can be attributed to combination of factors, including uh, uh, lower thickness, higher PVC, presence of higher, uh, larger particles, and the contaminations within the bulk of the coating. However, evidence suggested that presence of large particles or clusters of large particles that span the entire thickness of the coating play an important role. And finally, it is proposed that uh, the interface of aluminum hydroxide particles and the polymeric binder may be a weak point, which allows enhanced transport of different species, including aggressive species from the environment and the corrosion products within the uh, uh, corrosion, pro uh, corrosion products compared with the bulk of the coating. Therefore, bridging of the pigments and formation of elongated clusters of aluminum hydroxide particles or presence of large particles uh, with respect to the coating thickness, which expand the coating thickness, may provide easy transport passes uh, for aggressive species, which facilitate the coating failure and results in corrosion initiation. And finally, thank you for really listening. And I need to acknowledge actually uh, the funding of this project with Axon Nobel and Nicolas IRC. And I would like to thank all my colleagues in Sheffield, Manchester, and Liverpool. Thank you. Reza, um, so the paper's up for a couple of um, quick, or quick answers, I think, rather than quick questions. Okay, I've got a, a comment. Um, do you think the curing regime is, is important in terms of um, determining the interfacial cracking behavior? I think so, yes. Uh, because the curing actually can, can lead to, uh, uh, curing, uh, can lead to actually change the degree of the curing and cross-linking within the coating. That may change the stress within the coating as well. And that can affect how the cracks may generate. So is there very much control over that process? Um, I'm not sure. I need to talk with the people who actually done this. Also, I'm not sure about that. 